Kneel before Zor! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Demonoid, Messenger of Death, although we watched a version of the film that was retitled Macabre, released June 1st, 1981. It was written by David Lee Fain, F. Amos Powell, and Alfredo Zacarias, based on a story by Zacarias directed by Alfredo Zacarias, and released by American Panorama. So, wait, Macabre was the alternate title? I thought it was a character, I thought it was an actor name, or possibly, like, a musician credit. When it came up in the beginning of the <laughs> Yeah, I was like, Macabre, okay. Nope. Like, maybe, it's like, this is a special appearance by Macabre. This is technically, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get into it here. Director Alfredo Zacarias put the story together after a conversation with a psychiatrist friend about split personalities. If this was supposed to be about split personalities, I don't think Alfredo was listening very closely to that conversation. <laughs> His original intent was to convince Roger Corman to distribute the film, but eventually he decided to form his own indie distributor, the short-lived American Panorama, to release the film. The American release ran a little over 10 minutes shorter than the international version, but we watched the longer international one for this review, and I will discuss some of the differences at the end. The first major change is that the international cut was retitled Macabre, which was the original film's working title. I, I don't like either of the titles for this film. No, yeah. not, not especially. The Vinegar Syndrome Blu-ray actually includes pristine scans of both versions, which is nice. This film made an appearance on the German MST3K, which is called Schleffaz, or something <laughs> to that effect, which is a German abbreviation for worst film ever. I like that the German version is also like an abbreviation of a longer title. Right. The movie starts strong on the face of a screaming mummified corpse under a terrific score. We see the narrow back alleys, parks, and cemeteries of a small town at night. The footage moves underground to tunnels through catacombs. The next morning, we see Jennifer Baines pulled over at a lookout point, looking down on the city of Guanajuato, Mexico. What a beautiful city Guanajuato is. She's here to visit her husband, Mark, after six months apart. Her driver, Pepe, tells her that Mark is sorry he couldn't pick her up at the airport, but things are busy at the mine. Mines are very jealous, like most females. She asks what kind of luck Mark has had with this mine, La Quemada, which translates to the burned. He informs her in no uncertain terms that the mine is cursed. I, I like the scenario here in that she's just arrived and she's on her way to see her husband, but I guess she insisted that they stop or... Yeah, pull over here so I can look at the town. Yeah, like <laughs> get out of the car with me. It wasn't just like a, like a moment like where they just pulled over so she could take a quick look. But like they got out and she's sitting on the car. Like yeah. she's in no rush yeah. to get to her husband that she hasn't seen in six months. Well, he's obviously not in any rush to see her either. That's so. true. The score kicks up again. And I actually really love this piece of music, no matter how repetitive it is over the course of the film. Pepe drives Jennifer out to the mine. And she gets some cat calls from the miners as she steps out of the car. The people who operate the mine. They aren't young she children. She gets a cat call from an eight-year-old. <laughs> she walks up to the equipment counter and asks for a helmet in fluent Spanish. Pepe tells her that it's bad luck for women to enter the mine, but she laughs off his warning. I like that it's like an amusement park that's like, you know, like it's it's it feels like a concession stand that she's going yeah. up to mm -hmm. and be like, one helmet, please. And then she yeah. walks into the mine. <laughs> it's filled with nachos. <laughs> 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 you gotta eat the nachos first. Then yeah, you are. then you put it on. And you get that warm, cheesy hair. <laughs> She walks down a long mine shaft by herself and balances along the railway tracks in her high heels to avoid puddles. Like, she knows she's going to this mine. Right. Like, this mm -hmm. was not a surprise. Why did you wear this footwear? To be cute in the mine. She stops for a moment to lean against the mine wall, causing a small rock slide that unearths a mummified corpse that falls across her shoulder. She screams, and Mark appears instantly to console her. The other miners all swarm around the body, 
One of them finds a bag full of silver on the corpse. Mark Baines is ecstatic to find confirmation of silver in these mines. It's not like a bag full of silver either. It's just one giant clump of raw silver. Right. It still has a lot of rock to it. His men remind him that La Quemada will not surrender its treasures to any man. And like Jennifer, he waves away their superstitions. But what are they doing working here if this mine is cursed and won't produce anything? Yeah. What are they doing working here for a mine that's like so unstable? Right. Like the rocks keep falling. Every wall is an avalanche. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Also, spoiler alert, they've unearthed like a terrible room at the bottom, and I guess they haven't told anybody. Yeah. They've kept it secret so far. But it seems like a bad plan to be here if you think this whole mountain is cursed. Yeah. Pepe notices that the body is missing its left hand, and Jennifer asks what that implies, but Mark assures her that it's meaningless. We cut to the same screaming mummified corpse that started the film, and then pan across a cabinet full of similar mummies in a cheap-looking museum exhibit. Mark explains to Jennifer that these are the mummies of Guanajuato, and they really are. The scene was shot in what, since 1969, has been known as the Museum of the Mummies in Guanajuato, Mexico. The bodies are the victims of a cholera outbreak in the 1830s, They were originally given proper burials, but later dug up for not paying the taxes for perpetual interment. What? Is that that real? Yeah, the families were supposed to pay to keep them buried. How do you get a dead person to pay taxes? (laughs) Death and taxes. I mean, those are the only two concepts. The same mummies have appeared in 1970s Santo vs. the Mummies of Guanajuato and Werner Herzog's Nosferatu the Vampire in 1979. Seems weird that they were, like, preserved, though. You know, like I would imagine that. Well, if they're not buried, if they're if they're put on shelves in airtight compartments, then that's what kind of makes them harden like that. But also, is it seems like it seems weird. It's like you couldn't pay for your burial plot, so now we're gonna get charge admission for you to see your loved one. But it's also like we well, are gonna take you out of that building and put you in this building. And it's <laughs> like okay, I'm still in a building. Thanks. Yeah, I just I'm surprised uh, you know that the, the the bodies that they took out were in decent enough shape that mm-hmm. they could put them in a case and then they I guess they were mummified afterwards. I, I mean maybe maybe there's something special about the ground uh, composition that that caused maybe. the bodies to, to mummify. So they were mummified when they pulled them out. Maybe it was part of their embalming processes for the outbreak. Yeah, like maybe. maybe they had to like drain the fluids out. Some of the mummies we see are children and some are even babies. Jennifer is disturbed to find multiple mummies toward the end of the display that are all missing their left hands. Under his breath, Pepe whispers, La mano del diablo. And then needlessly translates for the two decent Spanish speakers. The devil's hand. Again, the white people mock Pepe's legend. And on their way out of the cemetery that houses the museum, Pepe leaves to visit his loved ones here, while Mark and Jennifer are offered mummy-shaped candies called mummy yummies by the local children. We cut to some time later as Jennifer pulls up to the mine and Mark tells her that the workers are refusing to go back into the mine now that she has entered it. She suggests that they, together, enter the mine and go to its lowest levels to prove that it's safe. Because they would know that you went to the lowest levels? Right. We see them climbing slowly down walkways to the bottom of the mine. In a hallway, Mark, like his wife earlier, leans against a wall, dislodging another hidden (laughs) passageway. Also, he tosses a rock down the the shaft to show how deep it is. Right. It's like, that's not a smart thing to do. No. It's going to, like, hit a support or something. It's like... Or a person. (laughs) Well, we... The guy hiding down there. Yeah, like, what is this, like, we've already established that this place is falling apart, practically. Right. uh, And you're just rolling bowling balls down these shaft holes. And he tells her that it's probably going to continue rolling down the steps for a half an hour. They crawl through this new passageway they found into a large open chamber. It's full of centuries-old torture devices. A human skull leaps off a shelf and lands on Jennifer, freaking her out again. What are you, collecting those? Oh, let's go back. Listen, I'm getting scared now. It's all right. I'll wait just a few minutes. Just a few minutes. I want to... Mark takes a few steps further and suddenly drops into what looks like quicksand. (laughs) Jennifer doesn't get back to him fast enough with something to grab onto, and he disappears under the sand, down a chute, and into what looks like a burial chamber below. He calls up to Jennifer to let her know that he's okay, and he jams a ladder in the chute for her to climb down. The whole time that we're in this antechamber, there's like this angelic choir right. singing his yeah. praise. It was like this is this the, the whole score for this film is amazing. Yeah, it's really great. It's so awkward though. This like pit that he falls into, 
you know, like it looks like he goes through quicksand, right? Yeah. And then he takes a ladder and push, just jams it, push up, it the up through, column. I guess, a pile of sand. And then does she push herself down through that same? I think. Sand I think most in? of the sand spilled into this room <laughs> oh, at the bottom. Okay. I'm just so like, now it's like an empty. Like a okay, it's yeah. a slide with a little yeah, sand. Exactly. On it. I feel like it's more like a dry sand pit versus actual quicksand. Yeah, it's, there's no water to it. The room is filled with statues and altars. There are two reservoirs of oil, and Mark sets fire to them to light the room. Jennifer supposes this is a cultist temple. They find evidence of child sacrifices, and Jennifer notices that the statue at the front is missing its left hand as well. On their way back out, Jennifer notices a silver hand-shaped case on a pedestal, and Mark yoinks it. I will switch around between calling this a case or a coffin or a clasp. It's all sorts of different things. I, I, I noted it as the hand box. Okay. It's a clutch. A clutch? A clutch. Oh. A, hand a clutch, clutch for clutching. A clutch clutch. <laughs> for some reason, they think stealing from this temple will undo the mind's curse and not activate it. Mr. Devil! We have broken your curse! Well, now the miners will have to come back to work. Back above ground, they show off the hand they stole, and all the workers walk out immediately. Why? Well, yeah, I don't know why they thought showing them that they stole an artifact from a cursed place would be like, oh, uncursed. Yeah, what? No, we're all you safe just brought now. the curse towards us. What are you doing? <laughs> Mark tells all the people who just quit that they are also fired. Back at their apartment, Mark explains to Jennifer that he will be financially ruined by the failure of this mine. All right, so this is where I was like, well, hold on a second. Didn't you just make some kind of amazing discovery? Yeah, can't you make a lot of money off of this? Archaeological find? Yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe like the rules are if you find stuff, it, it just immediately goes to the government. Yeah. But you would get like notoriety. People would want to interview you. Like, I feel like there's there could be money to be made here. Yeah. Um, also, have, you have just the government confirmed... compensate you because clearly you can't continue mining in this place. Right. But you could because they also confirmed today that there's lots of silver in this mine. Mm -hmm. There's there's plenty of non superstitious people you can get to work this mountain. You don't have to exclusively crew up with locals. Might be a union thing. <laughs> <laughs> sure, they're yeah. big on unions in Guanajuato. <laughs> the mining unions in Mexico are very strong. <laughs> Jennifer pours him some champagne to cheer him up. Later that night, Mark is heavily intoxicated and pops the clasp on the silver hand case to find that it's full of dust, which he then pours out on the table. He climbs into bed. We get more shots of the cemetery and mummies under creepy Gregorian chants. Alone in the living room, the dust reincorporates into a left hand over a series of dissolves. In the bedroom, Jennifer is startled awake by the gray disembodied hand climbing up her leg. The dissolves were kind of interesting because it looked like they made, you know, like, I don't want to call it a sand castle because it's a hand. Hand A castle. sand hand. They made a sand hand and then, like, it looked like they were brushing it away and then they mm. played the footage in reverse. Like, yeah. it's just, it was just kind of funny. <laughs> Jennifer screams, and Mark wrestles the hand back into dust, and then tries to convince her that what just happened was actually a shared nightmare, which isn't a thing. <laughs> it's been a nightmare, someone. Oh. It wasn't a nightmare. That hand grabbed you. Jennifer picks up the silver hand-shaped case and asks to see Mark's hand, but he backs out of the room, terrified. She pulls up to the mine and learns from Pepe that Mark forced the men to go down into the mine. How did he force hundreds of men into this mine that they were refusing to go into yesterday? Yeah, I, because uh, it doesn't seem like he has any kind of weapon. No, he just told them, you better get back down there. We cut to Mark unspooling the fuse on an explosive charge. Jen tries to talk him out of whatever he's doing, but it's no use. And he smashes the plunger when the mine caves in with all the workers inside. It's just a massive explosion fills the whole area with dust. No, the dust! So, at the end of the movie, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna spoil anything. I just want to skip ahead to my thoughts. I was trying to figure out why he had done this. I was like, was there something in that chamber that would stop the evil force, or something like that? Because. I don't understand. I think the evil force just wants to kill as many people as it can. I don't know what its motive is. I'll, I'll get to that, too. I'm not uh, really okay. clear on what it's trying to do. Yeah, I, I thought for sure because there was like a ceremonial dagger that was stabbed into like a 
uh, pedestal. It's going to be like the Omen 3. Yeah, it's like I thought, I was like, oh, they they must have needed something from that cave and now it's been buried. Uh, But no, yeah, it was just like, you know, you just blew it up. I mean, I guess maybe maybe to to prevent people from finding out more about it. I don't know. Mark jets off to Las Vegas and we cut to sometime later at the Sands Casino. Mark seems to be having a lucky streak and it's drawn the attention of another shady gambler. Mark is asking the woman beside him to blow on his dice for luck. He's rolling seven after seven like clockwork. Outside, we see Jennifer step out of a taxi and head into a hotel on the strip. As Jennifer enters the casino, we hear a page for Rondo Hatton. Page Rondo Hatton. Rondo Hatton, please. Hatton is a very recognizable character actor from the 30s and 40s. He had a distinctive face as a result of a medical condition called acromegaly, He was referenced in The Rocketeer with the character of Lothar, and his name has also been adopted by an annual Classic Horror Awards ceremony. And former guest of the show, Robert Leininger, is an actual Rondo nominee on account of his classic monster movie podcast, Pods and Monsters. She introduces herself to the man behind the front desk as the wife of Mark Baines, and he says that several women have already made that claim today. It's against company policy for him to tell her anything, even though he already has, but he invites her to try paging the man, from the house phones. So did I miss something? Did her husband became famous? No, we we don't explain that comment at all. Yeah. I would have assumed that the mind blowing up would have made him famous and not a desirable Yeah, way. he wouldn't so still like, be using his name if he were yeah. on the lam for killing yeah. 50 guys. Well, and or like people would not be after him because I figured the women were after him to try to get money. Money, yeah. right? That that would be why and because he's not he's not an especially attractive man <laughs> no but i don't know it's just weird well and clearly like he's been here a while and garnered a reputation to the point where women are looking oh maybe that's it because he's on such a lucky streak that women in the casino have been looking for him i i it's not clear how long he's been here so i don't know yeah. how long he's been racking up money at the casino but uh and and why yeah like that that's what's that's, the point if you're gonna win every time no or but yeah because i i don't again i don't understand what the hand's purpose is especially when we find out later what the hand is trying to do i i never found out what the hand was trying to do jen calls in a page for mark on the house phone and we cut back to the table where the shady guy is now betting on mark's success and encourages him to ride what he thinks is a rigged lucky streak we hear the page over the speakers, but Mark doesn't respond to it. Also, the shady gambler who is investing in Mark uh, has his girl over by him, and she keeps inspecting the dice. Like he, Mark keeps having her blow on him, but I think she's checking keep- them to make sure he's not swapping them out. Correct. At first, I thought they were security, like under. That's what I thought that's too. That's what I yeah. thought too. Yeah. At the last second before his last bet, Mark changes his wager, causing the man to lose his money completely on purpose. In the parking lot, Mark is getting in a car with the woman when he's cracked on the back of the head and shoved into the back seat of the car by the shady gambler. They drive down a dirt road and pull up to a tiny shack. The man drags Mark's still unconscious body inside, and we realize here that the woman blowing on Mark's dice was working with the bad guy the whole time. He asks her to park the car down the street. Back at the casino, Jennifer moves around the floor, looking for Mark to no avail. We hear another page for someone called Anwar Bodine, And I'm sure that's somebody, but Google was no help. Mark finally wakes up in the shack, tied to a table, and the shady guy and girl ask how he was cheating since throwing 23 successful dice rolls in a row is a statistical impossibility. Mark credits beginner's luck. The man says if he doesn't get an answer, he's going to cut off Mark's hands. But instead of talking, Mark effortlessly yanks his hands out of the straps and punches the man to the floor before choking him to death. That was the wrong threat. Right. Like, he could have said anything else, like, I'll chop your foot off. Yeah. But no, the hands the hands are a no. The woman scrambles to leave the shack, but Mark's left hand grabs her heart around the mouth, and she seems to just die automatically. Mark continues untying himself and looks at his magical left hand. He picks up Shady Man's machete and tries to take a whack at his wrist, but his arms won't cooperate. He loses his balance and falls into the corner of the shack, where his left hand grabs a can of gas and drenches him in it before lighting him on fire. Mark bursts through the shack wall screaming in flames, and the left hand buries itself in sand while the rest of his body burns. 
We cut to a morgue where Jennifer is being shown a body, but it's not Mark's. Apparently she's just touring local morgues, asking to see any unidentified corpses, and this was the last one they had. She asks about the woman Mark was seen with leaving the casino, and soon finds out that that woman was found dead just over the border in California, with two other bodies. One was Frankie Phillips, a local dirty gambler, but the other body was badly burned. Wouldn't Frankie's body have also been badly burned? Yeah, the whole shack went up. Jennifer is convinced that one of the bodies is Mark's. Weirdly, the cop tells her that a family member identified the second body, but won't confirm if it was her husband or not. So it's just like, maybe it was your husband, I don't know. But a family member confirmed who it was, mm -hmm. and they believe that he was a he lived in a neighboring shack. Do we ever find out who this family member was either? It's yeah. another thing that's just it's dropped just, and yeah. left. We, we, we just needed the production to move to California. Yeah. He tells her where she can find the body, but why doesn't he just tell her now if it was her husband or not? And also, why does he have that information? Yeah. Why does he have where the body is going to be buried? Right. Surely they wouldn't need to keep that secret from his wife. Why wouldn't they just say the body was transferred to some special John Doe division out in L.A.? Couldn't that shack have just been outside of Los Angeles? There's no reason for it's like, oh, no, someone claimed him, and then we sent him off to Los Angeles. The whole, the whole scenario is odd that Frankie and this girl are aware of this shack just across the border in California. I think they use it for this. But no, because they said that it belonged to some prospector. No, they said they thought he was a prospector who lived at a neighboring shack. Ah, so <laughs> he lived in a neighboring shack right there's a couple shacks on this block Got they're it. all part of an hoa together <laughs> he tells her the body is set to be buried at our lady of hope cemetery in inglewood which in real life does not exist but there is a cemetery in inglewood called inglewood park cemetery and i've actually been there because that's where my dad's parents are interred wouldn't that be an soa yes you're correct because <laughs> okay. they are shack owners yeah <laughs> There's a small church in the middle of the cemetery that serves as the opening location for a book I've been outlining for a decade now. She heads to Los Angeles to check the body for herself. We cut to the cemetery where Father Cunningham, as played by Stuart Whitman, is speaking over an open grave. As he finishes his remarks, his Bible seems to hop out of his hand into the open grave, and another cemetery worker jumps in to retrieve it. We get a quick moment with the priest at the front of his church, seeming to discuss his problems of faith with God. Can we talk about this Bible jumping in for a second, though? Yeah. I don't get it. What does it mean? Why did it happen? Oh, you expected them to answer that in the I Well, the I film? mean, like, here. okay, here's what I thought was happening in the moment, that somehow, because, like, this, this evil seems to be able to be transferred through, like, the dust... And I was like, maybe the it was like the body was, I don't know, maybe there was some dust in the ground here where the body was and it was trying to get on the Bible so that the guy, the priest holding it would, would then become the evil hand guy. But it doesn't get transferred to him. I know. Yeah. And then I'm like, why did that happen? Well, because I thought the same thing because he kisses the Bible. I was like, oh no, he's got the hand juice in his mouth now. <laughs> Confusion, Father, stirring inside of me. Like the wind that sent your Bible into the dust. The signs like that, wherever I notice, all saying the same thing. Turn away. So these so are sign. they're signs that he's interpreting as ditch religion because it's pointless. Oh, okay. So this is, but oh, so maybe it was the de the <laughs> devil's hand trying to trick him into ditching religion. So that was his sign. But to acknowledge it as a sign is to imply that you believe in a higher power that's right. doing right. something. It's weird to say, God's telling me not to believe in him. It's like, <laughs> who's telling you that? Because if it's God, yeah. then you believe in him. Yeah. Jennifer enters the room and hears the tail end of his prayer, but seems to catch the gist of it. He's surprised to find her in the church and informs her that they are closed. She tells him she has problems that she needs to discuss with him. That night... We can hear clanging and grunting coming from underground where Father Cunningham oversaw Mark's burial this afternoon. You mean Prospector's burial. Right, yes. <laughs> Prospector shack owner. Also, we never get a real explanation of why Jennifer becomes so gung-ho into the hand myth. Yeah. Like that she's now some kind of expert. Yeah. Because we missed all those months where he's been mm -hmm. collecting money from various las vegas hotels and she's been reading up on handbooks for his master plan of 
something. Getting rich. Eventually, an arm breaks through the dirt, and then back at the church, Cunningham tries to refute Jennifer's suspicions. He says that a family member claimed that the body belonged to an old prospector who lived in the desert. No autopsy was performed because the cause of death was obviously fire. She demands an exhumation, and he directs her to law enforcement with that request. She asks to see where Mark was buried, but I don't know what good that would do. Unless you were sure that he was already going to be busted up out of the ground. Or if you were just going to grave rob it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) As they walk to the grave, we come to understand that she has told the priest everything about the hand and the curse and the mine, which is probably why he seems so annoyed with her request. When she explains that she came to him first, he tells her that he is not flattered that she expected him to believe all this. So you came to me because of the weirdness of this. The supernatural, the black magic, the curses, the demonic possession. Well, if that's your reasoning, you can be sure that you've come to the wrong person. Basically admitting to her that he's having problems of faith. Back at the burial site, we see the full body has emerged from the grave and is now struggling to stand. By the time Cunningham and Jennifer reach the grave, it is empty and abandoned. At first, Cunningham assumes that the grave has been broken into, but Jennifer points out that the brakes of the coffin bend outward and that something must have escaped from within. Nearby, we can see Mark's animated remains trying to tuck themselves behind another headstone out of sight. Cunningham is creeped out and heads back to the church, and she follows him. She tries repeatedly to convince him that something supernatural is at work, but he insists on notifying the police. Later, we see Cunningham talking to Sergeant Matson about where to find the open grave, And Matson admits that these kind of crimes really creep him out, and he's thinking about quitting the force. How often does this happen that you're thinking about quitting your job over it? Is this common here? Well, that's why I feel like that's why Father Cunningham is just like, eh, you know, it's just grave robbing, it happens. Yeah. (laughs) Cunningham asks Matson to talk with him before making a decision like that. Matson checks out the grave uneventfully, and then we cut back to the church where Cunningham and Jennifer argue over the likelihood of a 300-year-old living hand. Back at the squad car, the cadaver is now smashing its arm in the car door repeatedly to cut the hand off. Yeah, so I'm I'm a little unclear about the hand's need to connect to a body repeatedly and then escape it. Disconnect, yeah. Like, I'm not, like, are they only good for a little while? Or are they only good until they turn on you? Well, but, like, for Mark, it seemed like he, he was trying to turn on the hand immediately but then the hand won that battle and then you know he did the things that the hand wanted and it it feels like everybody else later coming up in the film generally also is under the hand's control like i'm not sure why the hand would not want to use a whole body yeah i don't think they decided up front what the hand wants and what it's trying to do what the hand wants (laughs) That's that movie where Mel Gibson's taking a bath and he drops all the hand products in the yeah, bathtub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the hand acts strangely like when it's possessing because some of the people seem like fully aware that the hand is sentient. Yeah. And like are like, oh, I'm totally on board for whatever this hand wants to do. Yeah, everybody uh, else who gets connected to it like seems to know what it wants. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, yeah, I got it. Maybe it depends on your willpower. Maybe. The makeup for this burnt body is actually really great, though, because you can see blackened tissue and all these deep muscles around his face. But when the hand is successfully removed, it plops down in the seat inside the car, and the rest of the body goes lifeless. Yeah, but before that happens, I don't know exactly, maybe the moment that this resurrected body re-dies, but he turns his head like mm-hmm. after he's, I would think, still dead? Yeah. I don't know. Re-dead? <laughs> I think it would have been funnier if the hand was just like flopping and dragging the body across the yeah. grass. Like it, it, it had no control over any other muscle except the hand. But it can somehow use the whole body until it's separated. The hand starts honking the car horn to get Matson's attention. Matson finds the corpse there with its arm in the door and must assume that this has been posed in a way to scare him. After a moment of silence, the hand leaps out at the sergeant who fires two shots in self-defense but both miss. <laughs> what was he shooting at? He was trying to get just that like hand. Just like shooting at his face. Just like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> Cunningham and Jennifer rush to the source of the gunfire, and we cut back to Matson, who has lifted the cadaver and dumps it off the side of the road. 
He skids out of the cemetery before Cunningham can ask any questions. They see the cadaver on the side of the road, and before confirming that this is, in fact, her dead husband, she comments on the missing hand. Shouldn't she be a tiny bit sad? <laughs> Wasn't she married to this guy? We cut to a gym where Matson is pounding a speed bag. Cunningham walks in to check on him and asks what happened last night, but Matson is evasive. It also sounds like he's changed his mind about quitting the job and credits the change of heart to the cemetery and thoughts of life's fleeting opportunities. Yeah, so I want to stay a cop. Yeah. What? <laughs> he comments on the priest's form as he takes a few swings at the speed bag and invites him into the ring for a quick sparring match. At the end of the fight, Matson lands six or seven consecutive left-handed punches right in the middle of Cunningham's face in slow motion. The priest looks down for a moment, and when he looks back up, his crucifix necklace has fallen out of his shirt, and we get a sting of church music to correspond with the insert. Matson immediately turns and leaves the ring. And so, and this is another thing that I don't understand. The hand is scared of religious symbols. Well, the, not just that, but what what is it doing right now? Like, why just did beating it beating up a guy it didn't like? Well, but no, but why did why did it even go to the gym? Like, wh- <laughs> why is the hand telling Madsen you should go to the gym and work out? Wouldn't the hand be stronger if you took it to the gym and I, I used guess. it on a speed uh. bag? It's trying to gain strength. <laughs> Wouldn't that be gaining strength in your arms, though? Wouldn't, shouldn't you like be squeezing things? You should take them down to the fingerboard shop. <laughs> <laughs> Those didn't that exist Remo yet, I guess. Williams, uh, What? I thought you were making a Remo Williams <laughs> oh, reference. Oh, no. Not that fingerboard. I'm talking about the tiny skateboards. <laughs> not, not the big circle thing that you just poke for some reason. And that makes you a better ninja. I was just thinking like those like little like hand flexing. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I was thinking about. Like the little stress ball. That makes sense, too. Cunningham steps out of a taxi outside the church and Jennifer is waiting for him. She asks him to touch base with Sergeant Matson again and he says he just came from there. Matson's fine. I fought with him and he doesn't have any superhuman powers. It was a friendly match. Well then the hand does not possess Sergeant Matson. Well there's another line of reason. Oh, that there is no hand, right? Miss Baines, you're distraught, grieved, emotionally wrought. I really like how neither one of them has any patience for the other's theory. Yeah. But but Cunningham has to have seen that Mazin was acting peculiar. Yeah, but not peculiar enough for me to go, it's that 300-year-old hand that lady was talking about. No, but... He's like, seen no evidence of anything supernatural. Yeah. His friend got a little weird after he found a human corpse in your cemetery. Just saying, if either one of you... Changes your behavior in the slightest bit. If, if you Where ever go to a Anna? gym, Patrick. <laughs> oh, well, then we definitely know that you are He's not possessed. <laughs> Jennifer gives him her hotel address and room number, promising to destroy the hand before she leaves town. She walks back down the street alone and encounters Sergeant Matson, who asks her about her car. Excuse me, ma'am. Is this your car? Oh, hello. It's uh, Sergeant Matson, isn't it? I asked about your car. Yeah, this is my car. It's rented. Stolen. What? He shoves her in the back of the police car and drives her to a building labeled Plastic Surgery Center. Now, there's something weird that's happening in this scene. When she's in the squad car, she looks behind her and there's a motorcyclist. And she starts, like, nodding and the motorcyclist, like, waves. And I was like, is that... And I thought, I was like, is that Father Cunningham on a motorcycle? Like, was this a plan that that she was bait and he was going to follow her on a motorcycle? I didn't notice that at all. It's so weird. I mean, if you get a chance, don't force yourself to rewatch it. But she's in the car. She's struggling. Her glasses fly off. Yeah. And then she looks back and sees that there's a motorcyclist and she's like making head movements. And the weird. motorcyclist goes. And, and I don't think that it's live. I think it's a rear projection. I think it's a projection. Well, maybe, it, maybe it's just her trying to signal somebody for help and the motorist not understanding. And they're like, yep, yeah. hello, hi. At the plastic surgery center, we see a doctor and a nurse kissing on a couch, and they're startled when Matson and Jennifer bust in. Yes, officer? What can I do for you? What do you want? I want you to cut my hand off. <laughs> he holds out his left hand. Like, could, who, who are these people that are just going to do this for some random dude that says, come, come, well, I don't think up. they would have done it 
in any situation in this particular situation there why are they he's got a gun pointed at them oh he was pointing a gun at them yes okay sorry (laughs) we cut to the lobby of jennifer's hotel where cunningham is waiting for her he spots her car pulling into the lot and mistakes it for jennifer but it's a different lady in a similar car i guess I, I don't know what the point of this was, yeah. just to fake us out or remind us that he knows what her car looked like, um, so that later on we understand when he finds her car that he recognized it. At the doctor's office, Matson handcuffs Jennifer to a chair and directs the nurse and doctor at gunpoint to remove his hand without any anesthetic. In the name of God, don't do it! In the name of evil, you and I must obey. The doctor starts up a razor-sharp cauterizing blade and he slowly slices away at layers of flesh while Matson freaks out. In the past, when we see the hands separated, the body becomes unpossessed, and I was waiting for the moment where Matson was just going to lose it. Like, what happened? Why, why am I here? Yeah. Why are you cutting my hand off? Back at the church, Cunningham is melting glass to repair a stained glass window in his office. He makes a phone call to Jennifer's hotel. But he's not melting glass. And and th- the well, implication is that's what he's doing. Okay, but well, first of all, that's not how you make stained glass. You don't melt the people who glass. wrote this movie have no Second idea. Of all, I think what he's doing is pouring out molten lead, which you know the stained glass windows are leaded. But you also don't just pour like a crucible of lead out onto the glass. That is again not how you make it. Crucible, I get it. <laughs> what? Is it a religious term? I don't know. Crucifix. Isn't Crucible the name of the story? There is a story about the Crucible, but it's referring to the thing you melt metal in. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. I didn't know <laughs> he makes a phone call to Jennifer's hotel, and again, there's no answer. At the doctor's office, the hand sits on a tray, and Matson's stump is fully bandaged, and he doesn't seem upset about losing his hand at all. Matson lifts the tray to show it to Jennifer, and the fingers of the hand begin to move. It jumps to the gun, and the nurse tries to make a run for it, but then takes a bullet in the back. Matson swats his hand with his nightstick, but the hand catches it and jumps to Matson's face, quickly choking him out. So he has regained his normal self? It seems like starting when it landed on the gun, he suddenly turned back into Matson and decided he was going to stop the hand. The doctor offers some assistance, but the hand jumps to him and takes over his body. Jennifer runs for the door, and the doctor is painfully possessed by the hand. What's the hand's goal, really? It jumps into a person, and then demands to be separated, and then jumps to the next person. Could you prevent the next attack by preemptively chopping off your left hand? Because then it couldn't take over your body? I don't know. Hmm. Maybe that's why those people had all those chopped off left hands. Or just they were others in a long string of these situations. The doctor catches Jennifer before she can leave the building and gives her several injections of sedative from the same needle until she stops trying to escape. Ugh. Sorry, I I was double-checking the meaning of crucible just to make sure I wasn't sounding like an idiot. Did we talk about the weird mummifying of the characters? That hasn't happened yet. It's just about to. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. From the last injection, we can see here that the syringe is empty, so it looks like he's just injecting air into her veins to give her an embolism. <laughs> yeah, but he's also very just like awkwardly like, oh, I'm going to stick it up here in your armpit, I'm yeah. stick it over here in your side, <laughs> stick it in your back. <laughs> Cunningham finally finds Jennifer's rental car still parked outside the church where their last conversation happened, and her keys are still in the trunk like she was taken suddenly. He searches through her car, and he finds the silver hand case. Back at the doctor's office, he tells the unconscious Jennifer what amazing work he has done with the hand. And we see Matson and the nurse, who both appear strangely mutated on separate stretchers, but Jennifer is untouched. I don't know what he did to these people. Their heads are elongated. They have no hair. I know, and they, they, their skin is all wrinkly, like, they, like they're like they dried out or mummified, kind of. And it's we never weird. see them again after yeah. this moment. Is the implication that the hand, as the plastic surgeon has committed some kind of medical damage to these or i don't know is it that they become mummified once the hand is detached but the hand was never attached to the nurse oh that's true that we saw maybe it just hopped over real quick a police officer drives cunningham to the plastic surgery center where they've spotted a squad car parked overnight and as he's getting out of the car cunningham notices an inscription on the inside of the hand case the doctor tells jennifer that he wishes that he could keep the hand but for some reason, it belongs to her. Cunningham walks in with the hand case, and the doctor flies out the door, seemingly terrified. 
Jennifer begs him to unstrap her from the table, and he does. Outside, the doctor peels out of the parking lot and almost hits that cop that drove Cunningham here. The three of them hop in the squad car and chase the doctor. Yeah, the, the officer goes, quick, get in the car. He'd be like, I'd be like, no, you wouldn't. You do that. Yeah, you do that. We're, We're going to stay that's here. That's not our job. The doctor's reckless driving sends several cars flipping through the air, landing on their roofs. And there's some really... The, the only part of the music that I don't like is in this film is this chase, because it's very, like, Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah. The police car and the doctor's convertible are eventually trading paint alongside a moving train, and the doctor is able to hop out of his car onto the train to escape. The police car skids to a stop, and the unpiloted convertible crashes into it. As the train passes a railside water tower, the doctor is knocked off the side. This didn't have to happen. He noticed with plenty of time to avoid crashing into the tower, but this is what needed to happen. Well, yeah, the the hand wants to get detached. Right. So it, it forced the doctor to let go. Yeah. The doctor squirms his way back to the track and throws his arm under the passing wheels. The fast cuts here are really effective, and it honestly looks like a train is cutting off a human hand. Yeah. <laughs> The next shot is the hardest for me to explain from a production standpoint. We are under the moving train, and we can see the hand moving around in the dirt between the rails. So this is clearly a real hand, meaning someone is buried under the tracks here, but something's moving over the tracks. It's just really interesting the way they did it. I'm sure it's all fake. It's fake rails. It's a fake train. But it looks like they somehow got a person to lay under dirt under the train Mm -hmm. and stick his hand up out of the dirt. The hand jumps into the air and gets a grip on the underside of the train to ride off into the distance. Now, Jennifer explains the hand's motive since the film so far has failed to. We gave it its freedom, so when Mark died, the hand became mine. Oh, it captured others, yes, but uh, inevitably just to get back to me. Mark didn't just die, the hand killed him. If it wanted to be connected to him, why did it intentionally disconnect from him? Why Why does it then become hers? Why does she inherit it? Because marriage? Is it, is oh. it just following it's legal? Like, okay, sure. That makes sense. Three, three whatever, a thousand years ago, 300 years ago? 300. 300 years ago, they definitely had those same laws. Right. Yeah. It would have made more sense if she was the one who picked up the box or right. the one who opened it. Yep. Cunningham seems convinced enough at this point to offer his assistance in destroying the power. Do you believe that there is a hand? Well, there's something. She admits she heard him questioning his faith when they first met, and he confesses that his religious background might protect him from the hand's power. Cunningham drops her off at her hotel, and later in her hotel room, we see her brushing her hair as the hand pushes its way up out of the shower drain. Back on the road, Cunningham encounters a traffic jam, and is asked to administer last rites to a dying man in a car wreck. In the hotel room, Jennifer steps into the shower, impossibly ignorant of the hand crawling right beside her feet. Also, why doesn't the hand try to take her? No, it doesn't care. How does the hand know where she is? Handar. Like, it was riding a train and just jumped off and made it to her hotel. Yep. Mm -hmm. Drain. (laughs) You always have these problems with severed hand movies. (laughs) Where you're like, how did the hand... And it's like, how did the hand anything? How did the hand anything? (laughs) It's a hand. Yeah, but that was my one, you know, suspension of disbelief. Now I'm like... (laughs) What, the hand has a really good sense of direction. Did, did Does the hand retain memories of people? Did the guy know where she was before the hand The hand literally hand has severed? one sense. <laughs> it's touch. That's it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> when Cunningham gets to the dying man, he uses his dying words to say, Swing away. No, I'm just kidding. He says, Father, save her. Save her. He's dead. So then the hand transferred information to the next, because this is just some random delivery driver. So that means the information stayed in the hand from the last guy. And then this guy got it into him from the hand. And he's like, oh, you're chasing a lady. I think God gave him these words, not the hand. Oh, okay. Because it's like signs where they're like, oh, it's just synapses firing. She said a random phrase when she was dying in the car. And it's like, it wasn't just a random phrase. It was God communicating to us through her last words. Is that what that movie was trying to say? Yes. Science? Oh. Oh, yeah. God, I I watched it once when it came out. I thought, I don't remember. All right. Then we cut back to the hotel. She turns off the TV and yanks the sheets off the bed to reveal the severed hand under the covers. 
She rushes to the closet and grabs the hand-shaped case, but it's broken somehow. Yeah. So she drops it on the ground. What? Why wouldn't we see this get broken when it got broken? Why would we just have to understand it from a mid shot? And it's how, almost a wide shot across the room of her. And how would you break it in that manner? It seemed like it was pretty solid. Right, but like, there's not even how an is insert. It broken? I don't know. She says it's broken. She says the yeah. coffin is broken. So and they leave it and they never come back to it. So every time we've seen it, it seems like a pretty sizable hunk of metal. Yeah. Like Jamie Lannister's metal hand in Game of Thrones. Right. Yeah. But in this scene, when she finds it broken, it's like a pie tin. Yeah, and it's all bent. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like the hinges are screwed So, up. like, in theory, the hand went and broke his Yeah, maybe, thing. but we should have seen that happen if that's yeah. what happened. Sounds like a very hard shot to get. Well, because I really wanted the hand box to be this thing. Because, like, 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 contained it? Well, yeah, like, you have to, like, put it around the person's arm that has it, and then you just close it, which which severs the hand well, inside the box. I thought, was, yeah. Yeah. That was kind of what I imagined was supposed to happen was once they contained this thing back into the, you know, the, the place from whence it came, it would be mm-hmm. right. contained it's again. Like in Dark Shadows when he's in the, he's, he starts the movie in a silver coffin mm. that's keeping him separate from everything else. He yeah. can't possibly escape from it. You have to literally dig him up and open it to let it out. But they could have put him back in one. Yeah. Or the genie from I Dream of Genie. That's right. Or any genie, really. <laughs> <laughs> from anything. <laughs> When Jennifer opens the door to leave the hotel room, she crashes into Cunningham, and he finally sees the crawling hand for himself. He rushes Jennifer out the door, and the hand has to crawl to a window to follow them. See, this I immediately would have just, like, get the hand wrapped up in the blankets. Yeah. And then just, like, I don't know. At least you have it. (laughs) My plan would have been just do, I don't know. I don't know, make it snuggly. (laughs) Just make it, just make it cuddly. What? <laughs> just flip the mat, flip the mattress onto it. As they're moving through the parking lot to escape the hotel, the hand jumps from the windowsill onto the back of the car, and somehow neither of them hears it land. They drive directly to the church, and the hand hops off the car and crawls into the church through a basement door. Cunningham tries to put in a call to the police, and Jennifer points out again how stupid that is because they can't do anything about a living hand, but they can shoot it. He senses the hand's presence, and they move into the church. Wind begins to stir in the room, tossing the chandelier back and forth, but then, just as suddenly, it stops. Jennifer wanders around the room making adjustments to every creaky door she can find so that the hand won't forget where they are. I, I, well, I thought that the doors were moving on their own, and she was every time she approached one, it was moving. Oh, is that what's going on? I think so, which is odd, because not only are like the chandelier blowing in a weird wind inside, and the doors are swinging, but candles are blowing out. And right. I'm like, up until this point, the things that have been happening have been the hand doing mm-hmm. things. But these are the first things that are like, a supernatural force yeah. outside the hand is affecting the world. That makes sense. It's weird. The main door slams shut, trapping them inside. Jennifer calls out for Cunningham and gets no response. Cunningham finds a hand on the ground, but quickly realizes that it is the plastic hand of a Jesus mannequin at the front of the church. But then the camera tilts down from the face of Jesus to the empty sleeve, and the devil hand comes crawling out of the <laughs> sleeve, and then it leaps onto his face. I, like, I, I was like this whole section. Yeah, it, this is one of those like what I want to happen right now, and then it happened. Yeah, he struggles against it for a while as Jennifer runs screaming through the church toward him. It's a long scream, and it's clearly looping a few times. <laughs> The hand wrestles Cunningham to the ground, and Jennifer pleads with it to take her instead. I don't know why. (laughs) Why do you deserve to die more than this old priest character who just gave up his meaning of life? When it hops toward her, Cunningham catches it in the air and squeezes it tight in his hands. Eventually, dust drops from his palm, and Jennifer asks for some indication that he has not been possessed by the hand. For no reason, because he would be... Yeah, like that's every- what happened to every person who did this so far. This hand wasn't meant for you. That's right. It was meant for you. So I have to destroy you to keep it. I will kill you. He chases her through the church, knocking over his delicate stained glass artwork. She emerges from her terrible hiding place behind the altar when he gets close. Yeah, it, it, she's like so surprised when she pops up. Is like, oh, I never thought you would look back here. 
the only thing I could be hiding behind. She moves outside, but somehow he sneaks around in front of her and chases her upstairs. She hides again when he follows her and finds her very quickly, probably using the same powers the hand does to follow her without eyes or a brain. She's backed up beside the furnace that Cunningham was using to melt glass or not glass. Lead, I think. Melt lead. And See, I, I thought that it was going to be some kind of silver and that they were going to... That's what I thought. I was waiting this whole time. I'm like, oh, now I understand you're melting a metal and you're mm-hmm. going to encase the hand. This is all coming full circle. Okay, I get that you set this up. Now, that's not what's happening. Yeah, <laughs> the like, priest like, is like, I keep this giant silver crucifix in the wall behind my desk. Where'd yeah. you get this? Well, you know that shipwreck a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I thought for sure this was going to end with them like Johnny Tremaining the hand. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly. I was thinking the same thing. Jennifer is holding on tight to another stained glass panel, keeping Cunningham on the other side. She threatens him with a chisel or something, and Cunningham smashes his hand through a section of the stained glass window. Somehow, she's getting a signal from Cunningham to hand over the chisel, and she presents it to him. He takes it in the devil hand, but then right away the other hand takes it away. She puts her face in the palm of the evil hand, and he raises the chisel as if to stab her through the head. Is she like licking his hand here i can't tell what she's doing yeah she's like caressing it with she, her face with her face yeah like i'm like it seems like she's just rubbing her face in there like maybe she was going in for a good lick of the hand i don't know you know what they say I, lick of the hand I, I, <laughs> honestly i think what she's trying to do seduce is the seduce hand. the <laughs> seduce yeah. hand yeah she's like buying F- uh, father cunningham time yeah But then when he raises the chisel as if to stab her through the head, she pulls away at the last second and the chisel pierces through the wrist of the devil hand. The chisel is too long to be pulled back through the whole stained glass window, so I assume that the hand would make a bigger hole now, but it seems trapped. Cunningham regains some power over himself and asks Jennifer to hand him the blowtorch on the other table. See, how how did you know that? Because I'm sitting there thinking that the hand is still in control of, of Cunningham and I'm like... Why would you hand him the blowtorch? No, I for sure wouldn't because I would assume the hand. The only reason I know is because of hindsight. Well, right, but I'm just like, what What indication do we have that this was the priest that she should hand him the blowtorch? Because I would not be handing this guy more yeah. weapons. I wouldn't give him the chisel in the first place. I would have stabbed it through the wrist myself. Yeah, and, and she should have been the one to blowtorch it. Like, even if he was just like semi like saying like the blowtorch like oil can like yeah like yeah like yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, he's struggling to tell her what to do but yeah. then he's fighting the hand yeah but and then she would do it yeah but him like is like oh yeah here, here you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah so she gives it to him and he blowtorches his own hand uh i guess it's it's to set up the next line where he quotes from the bible matthew five thirty. if i hand a finny Cut it off and cast it aside. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So the point is that he's doing it to himself to save himself. Sure. We cut to Jennifer and Cunningham on a boat all of a sudden. Do you recall the last time we saw a burial at sea? Death ship? It was after Death Ship. Herbie Goes Bananas? It was Herbie Goes Bananas. (laughs) And then we cut from them throwing the hand into the ocean to sometime later where Jennifer is moving around a room watering plants and we see a hand pop up in the window behind her to tap the window pane, which I laughed out loud at when I saw it because I was like, okay, I get the joke. Someone's trying to get her attention, but they want us to think it's this hand is coming back. But like that doesn't pay off though. Who taps on the window? No, it does. It does? It's the, it's the same person that she that sees com- here. That yeah. comes to the door? Yeah. Oh, because it, there was such a long period between yeah. the window tapping and the door thing. I'm like, well, that can't be the same person. Yeah. Well, first we see this hand slap the window, and then she notices a puddle on the floor, accompanied by a magical shimmering sound effect. She hears a knock at the door and moves to answer it, but when she opens the window in the door to see who it is, a hand bursts through but it's connected to the arm of a man who was knocking and didn't realize he was knocking on the window and the door. I just love like how complicated that bit is, but it Mm -hmm. actually makes sense that he would have put his hand through right after she opened it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, ma'am, your doorbell doesn't seem to be working. I've got a package here for a uh, Mrs. Baines. Yes, yes. 
She opens the door, and the man gets her signature in exchange for a suspiciously hand-sized box. In another puddle, she finds a piece of seaweed floating around. She takes the box to her desk, and when she opens it, she finds more seaweed inside, above another layer of wrapping paper, and then she pulls out a candle, where you might have expected a hand to be, and exhales a sigh of relief. But it's like a really gaudy black candle and a yeah. crystal base. It's kind of creepy. I don't even know who's supposed to have sent this. Like The did, hand. Did the hand light candles? I don't remember the hand doing anything with candles. It blew some out, apparently. In some, well, maybe, I don't know. Something blew some them. out in the church. She notices a faucet nearby dripping, and when she moves toward it to shut it off, she sees the hand climbing up over the lip of the sink toward her. So, hold on. They threw the hand overboard into the ocean, Mm -hmm. and it just turned back into a hand in five seconds like it does every time, which somehow they didn't expect it to do. They did nothing different. Yeah. Like, they might as well have just thrown the moving hand into the ocean, and it would have come right back. So, it swam through the pipes and came up into her house? Well, in her defense, she didn't see her husband open the hand coffin and see all the dust inside. Yeah. So, for as far as she's aware... There was a full hand inside that coffin, and then burning it and putting the casting the dust away would be effective. Why would that be effective? She's seen it go from dust to being the next person's hand. Yeah, because she saw her husband crush it, oh, and then true. it turned, and then that's it turned true. him evil. And she also saw the same thing happen to the priest, where he right. smashed it in his hands, and, and if it you turned just into pour his it hand. into the ocean. You're gonna have a bunch of fish that turn to evil, evil fins. fish hands. <laughs> <laughs> the fins. <laughs> Are you telling me that you have a problem with the the sentient hand logic of it swimming out of the No, this my water? problem is entirely with the human logic. Okay. That they thought that this would stop it for some reason when it's no different than anything they've tried so far. Where did all the puddles in her house come from? Magic. Because if the hand isn't even in there yet. Mm-hmm. How did it how did it drop seaweed in the puddles in the house? How did it send her a package? <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, two clicks. <laughs> How did it send her a package with seaweed in it? <laughs> I don't know. I really wanted this to be like a whole elaborate thing. Like we would have a flashback scene of Mark in Vegas buying like the evil candle and then sending it to his wife. Yeah. But she turns to run away from the hand and it jumps, catching her in the back of the head and the music kicks in hard again. I really love this soundtrack. Yeah. Here. She's spinning around the room, flailing, screaming to herself, and we get a match cut to the screaming mummy face from the start of the film, and then we fade to black for the credits. In the United States version of the film, which, as I said, is 11 minutes shorter, we actually get a lot more footage um, because they just cut little tiny things out to make room for these bigger scenes that were shot for an American audience. Ideally... What I think you should watch is an edit of these two together to include all the scenes from here that are not in the international version. Mm. But keep the international score. Right. We start with two men in cloaks carrying the hand-shaped container. They find a blonde woman in a robe who is able to deflect them with martial arts-esque combat moves. She lifts one of the men high in the air by the throat and then drops him dead on the ground. Two more hooded men pin her against the wall and handcuff her there, and her boobs pop out of her shirt as she struggles against them. So, American audience needs boobs. Right. One of the men grabs a big axe and then chops off her hand with it. It's actually a really fun prosthetic, and for whatever reason in the version I watched, all of her screams are muted. I think that's actually how it plays. The hand hops out of her handcuffs and then crawls along the floor as the woman screams, and one of the hooded men stabs the hand with a dagger, and then drops it in the silver hand case. We get a couple of quick inserts of the silhouette of a devil holding a sword in the air in a swirl of fog, and lightning crashes behind him as we dip to black and then come back up with the opening credits we saw in the international version. Yeah, so when I was doing my research and I saw a poster with the devil character and the sword, I was like, oh, that's so awesome. I can't wait to see that. And it's not in the international It's not in there. But the weird thing is that this scene that we just described is what they should have done the whole time. Put Just put the hand back in the case, and you're done. They did that, and it stayed in that hand for 300 years. They put it deep underground where nobody would find it, and then people found it. 
even during these opening credits though as i mentioned before the the new score is terrible um it's it's not even an original score it's like a reuse of all these old 70s soundtracks but the original score for the international version is incredible uh other things that change from one version to another when mark kills the woman in the desert shack his left hand squeezes her head so hard that you can hear her skull breaking inside of her head and her face is like collapsing like a rubber mask. But it looks really awesome, actually. When Mark's body is escaping from the grave in the cemetery, we actually get a shot of the entire corpse exploding up out of the dirt right mm. before they walk up to the aftermath. When the hand attacks Matson at the doctor's office, it also crushes his skull inside his head and blood just oozes out of the back of his head. And then at the very end of the film... After Jennifer spins around the room screaming, the hand throws her face down hard through a glass coffee table and the exploding plate glass slashes her face open all over the place. So she's being murdered in the last second of the film. But the international version ends on like a freeze frame of a a picture of a dragon on the wall in the house for some reason. So were these things that were cut from the international version or at, like filmed and added? They were filmed for the American version. The American version came out first. And then when they were making an international version, they cut the intro scene, that last moment, and all the gruesome blood stuff. For some reason, they thought in international, it would play better with no nudity and no gore. And but so, they had to add, they added a bunch of other stuff back in. Yeah, just, just character stuff. I mean, I do prefer the ending of it not murdering her, but potentially possessing her. Yeah. I think that that's more of the point of the story yeah um is then that that it wins but it seemed like that wasn't what it was trying to do at first with mark it's like i want to go to vegas and gamble yeah. that's what i want to do evil hand and if you're if you're gonna go to vegas wouldn't you want to play poker you're a hand yeah come on well craps is also a very hand driven game right but you have a hand like right cards in your hand i like this movie i thought it was fun I do think that it would be much better if you spliced the American version and uh, the international version because the international version is fine, but it's slow and it doesn't have any real gore. And so it's it's missing out a lot. Meh. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I would tell anybody to watch this movie. I don't think there's anything particularly special about it. So that's a thumbs down from you. It's a thumbs down. No, I'm torn because I'm kind of in the middle between you guys because... I was like, I really like the ideas. And I was like, man, if they just did this or if they just did that, it would yeah, have been really... Yeah, but they didn't, so it's yeah. a thumbs down. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving it a thumbs up just because there's a couple moments here that I think are wonderful. Um, specifically, that moment when it jumps out of the sink to grab her by the back of the head and the music kicks in real hard. Or the Jesus hand leaping off and attacking the priest. Like, those two moments are really fun like mm -hmm. out of context gif things that like if a movie has like four of those then it's automatically enough for me to to call it a thumbs up movie and there's a bunch in here yeah i, I think i'm gonna give it a thumbs down only because like i wasn't sure what the hand was trying to accomplish they 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 give you a lot of loose threads that don't go anywhere like why did he blow up the mine what was the significance of the father Cunningham finding that inscription on the inside of the coffin? Yeah. We never find out what it said. Yeah. Like, is it, is it like instructions or like, uh, I, I don't know. Like it is weird that there's so many loose threads that they introduce and they're like, we're not going to come back to this. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of, uh, Mrs. Baines and there's a person who identified the body out in the desert. And it's like, what, who, why, where, where, why is this happening? Yeah, and why did it go to, why did he go to Vegas? Why wasn't he like internationally sought out for mass murder? Why did she go to Vegas looking for him? How did she know to go to Vegas yeah. to look for him? I feel like she's just always six months behind him. Like, yeah. They spent their entire marriage six months apart. <laughs> Every time she catches up with him, he blows up a mine and disappears. Well, and cause I'm assuming that Pepe filled her in on, yeah. information <laughs> also pepe's every pe every one of pepe's line deliveries in the beginning of the movie is amazing yeah <laughs> he's so serious like, yeah not 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 even the slightest bit of like everything he says is is intent and purposeful yeah 
it, it's like a woman cannot enter the mine. Yeah. Uh, I gave him a weird accent. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but that's just the intensity that he had. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did. I did enjoy it. Yeah. I, um, I liked it. I, 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 I just can't recommend it. Um, the and, rules don't make sense. Yeah. I really just wanted to see somebody's hand get closed in that box. Yeah. And why did the doctor make mutants? <laughs> why did that doctor make two mutants in his office? I don't know. And he's like saying, oh, you're going to be really proud of me. It's like, is the uh, as the doctor or as the hand? Does the hand think this is what I wanted to wake up to? Is the hand still think it's Mark? I don't get it. But even that guy, when the doctor had it, he was like, I really want to keep the hand but it belongs to you. And it's like, if you want to keep the hand, why doesn't the hand want to stay on you? I don't understand why it has to jump to anybody else. What do you have letterbox, Jess? Uh, I don't have it particularly high. What? <laughs> I have it at 62 out of 71. Okay. It is below scared to death and above firecracker. Richard. Uh, I actually have it at 41. Uh, which puts it below all night long, but above the Monster Club. All right. Um, I actually have it at 32, which is under Nighthawks and also above Monster Club. You guys are both wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you guys come up with your favorite movie hands yeah R richard gave yeah. us the, the vague task of bringing our favorite movie hands <laughs> to the show quite sure of the parameters <laughs> yeah i i mean they don't have to be severed from what i understand well again because uh yeah I, so i'm kind of i'm just curious what you guys came up with there were there was it was a very loose assignment yeah well um we should start at our number threes i would say oh i didn't rank them i, I didn't rank them because i figure we all have this at least one that's the same i think so probably maybe and I'm going to say that it's going to be Thing yeah. from the, the Adams Family. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. so yeah. other than Thing from the Adams Family. <laughs> Which, you know, I, I honestly didn't want to include him on the list because I was like, that's way too obvious. Yeah. But it really is the best yeah, looking it is the one. Best one. It is. Um, so my first one is Ash's Evil Hand yep, from the Evil Dead. I have that Dead. on my list too. Oh, yeah. I didn't pick that one. Oh. But I am far, I'm far, I'm far less familiar with that movie than you guys are, Oh, okay. I, um, I picked... Uh, the hand from Idle Hands. I knew you would. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know me in a Devin, Devin Sawa. Sawa movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the only one I have other than Adam's Family and Evil Dead 2 is my number one was Leprechaun 4, Leprechaun in Space. Because at the end of the film, they, spoiler alert, they, they put the leprechaun out the airlock and he explodes. And as his hand is drifting past the window, it flips everybody <laughs> off. <laughs> Excellent. Um, one of mine is uh, the greatest hand model ever in the world, J.B. Pruitt from, <laughs> from Zoolander, Zoolander. <laughs> who has his hand still attached, but in a hermetically sealed and preserved jar <laughs> at the end of his arm. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, some of my honor. Uh, did you have more? Jenny? Yeah, I, oh, had my, I didn't do my, my third one. Um, again, I picked a hand that I just thought was really cool. It's, again, not you know severed but i'm like i picked the 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 creature from pan's labyrinth that has the Ooh. eyeballs in his hands and puts yeah. them over his face to see i'm like those are the coolest hands that I, that, that i would certainly would say that one speaking of eyeballs and hands there's a creepy one in the gate yes where he's got the eyeball in the palm of his hand i was just thinking about that yeah. and he stabs it out with a piece of glass it's it's horrifying you've never seen the gate have you i haven't it's great. It is really great. I was trying to think of, um, I couldn't remember it. I don't think it's Cat's Eye, but I thought it was another like uh, anthology anthology film, like horror film, where they like wish on a monkey's paw. Oh, there's. I definitely remember something like that. And I can't remember what it was like. Maybe one of the creep shows or something, but I couldn't. I couldn't figure out which one it was. But I was like, I, I, I have a vivid memory of, of a curling up, of a curling up monkey mm -hmm. paw, and I can't remember what it's from. Outside I of think the Simpsons. I think there's yes. a Tales from the Crypt episode. Oh, maybe it was Tales from the Crypt. Maybe yeah. that was it. Did you have other honorable mentions, Richard? Oh, I, I had like I, I really went on a roll on. Yeah, this. I have a few like, here too. So, um, I wanted to mention uh the Mask of Zorro and Three Fingered Jack. Oh, okay. Um, only because. That was historically tr true that uh, Captain Love 
would when he was seeking out these bandits right here in Camarillo. When he, really? he killed one of them on the Conejo grade. Oh my uh, gosh. Back that's, in the, that's like, you could see it. If you went outside, you could see it from yeah, our front yard. Yeah, back back in the day, he killed one of the Murrieta gang right here in Camarillo. But in order to prove that he had killed some of these people, he cut off their heads and put them in jars. And for Three Finger Jack, he cut off his hand because he was like- So he could thing. show the three fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he displayed them. And like they were on display like as these so were his big- really big jars. Yeah. Um, and, but that, ha- that but they show that in the film Mask of Zorro for that <laughs> character. <laughs> it just reminded me of uh, Inside Moves. He's like, well, what if, it, what if his penis didn't fit in the jar? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I only brought that one up because it was like, it's like- Three th- three finger jack isn't part of the the kill here in Camarillo, but uh, it's part of that legend. So. Yeah. I also on my hand list I put a couple of fake hands. Mm. Uh, one of them are the hands that Edward Scissorhands destroys when Vincent Price dies. Oh yeah. Mm. Uh, because I always like the image of the blades like cutting through them as yeah. he's collapsing to the ground, and then the other one is the giant hand from the Jackass movie that comes flying around the corner and slapping people <laughs> to the ground <laughs> because that bit always cracked me up so good. Uh, I have Luke's hand yes, <laughs> that of gets course. cut off in the Empire Strikes Back. Um, this is a, a, a stupid one, though, because uh, it's only really funny to me. Um, the opening gambit of the movie Yellowbeard yeah. um, is them storming a ship uh oddly for our next movie the ship is crewed by cheech and chong (laughs) um but graham chapman as yellowbeard and peter boyle as his second in command bosun moon get to this treasure chest and yellowbeard just slams the treasure chest closed on (laughs) on his hand and so when they when he when they open it up the hands just sitting in the chest (laughs) nice um i was also going to read some of our uh the twitter submissions uh, Mr. McGrath also sent in the hand from uh, the Adams Family thing. The Futurist sent in The Beast with Five Fingers from 1946. Uh, it's this guy playing the piano with this oh. with the, dismembered hand. Mm-hmm. Rich Bergen said the hand from The Crawling Hand. Yvonne Gulabong said the hand from Kingpin with the ring on it <laughs> that got oh, stuck in the nice. ball. Uh, what, was it the ball return that took the hand off, or how did the person lose the hand? Woody Harrelson, uh, yeah, uh, Bill Murray ran out while Woody Harrelson had to cough up the money, which he, which he didn't have. Oh, so okay. He shoved his hand into the ball return. In the end of the movie, he's got a prosthetic hand, and he's got the ring on it. Yeah, that's what the picture that they sent along was the mm-hmm. the prosthetic with the ring on it. Uh, Mark Evan Naff sent a gif from the uh, the animated Adams Family movie that just came out recently. Uh, we had a vote for Evil Dead Two from Kid Phantasm. Uh, Carlo had another vote for Leprechaun 4, <laughs> The Hand in Space. <laughs> yes. Michael Rosenberg sent in Unchien Angelou, the one where they slice the eye open. Oh, the Andalusian, film. Do- Andalusian Dog? Yeah, Andalusian Dog, but the... The hand with the ants crawling out of it? Yeah. Which I said reminded me of the Phase 4 poster, ants crawling out of the hand. Helen Carey put in another vote for uh, Devin Sawa yeah. in Idle Hands. <laughs> um, we got another vote for uh, for Evil Dead 2 from Old Man JB. Um, Helen also sent in a picture from I thought you were going to do this one the video drum hand oh the video drum hand that would have been a good one long live the new flesh Steven Sperling uh, suggested this giant fake hand that they used in Hitchcock's Spellbound 1945 hmm. it's pulling the trigger on a gun pointed at the camera he also sent in the, the squirming severed hand from the 1972 Tales from the Crypt and the 1927 The Cat and the Canary has a spooky house with with a hand that haunts people. What about the hand from? <laughs> this is stupid. The hand from uh, Going Ape. Oh, in the in the drawer. In, in, the, in the like mediums. <laughs> I forgot uh, about that. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, he also sent in the hamburger helper hand. Oh, that's which a great is one. not technically in a movie. <laughs> and then his last one, I think, was uh, was the giant King Kong hand because on set at least it wasn't connected to a, a giant yeah, ape. It was just that's a hand. Awesome. Our writer, director, and story came from Alfredo Zacarias. Most of his credits are for Spanish language films that I didn't recognize, but he did write and direct The Bees, starring John Saxon and John Carradine, not to be confused with The Swarm, which Mm -hmm. we watched recently. Writer David Lee Fain was a Foley artist by trade on a lot of Star Trek movies. His only other feature writing credit was for Cheerleader Camp. The other writer, F. Amos Powell, 
The only other credit I recognized was an episode of Hawaiian Eye, which we just brought up in our last Patreon review because it starred Anthony Isley, who played Mike in Dracula vs. Frankenstein, and Pete in our other OID title for this season, another Patreon review for Monstroid, which placed dead last on my 1980 chart of <laughs> 185 titles. <laughs> the music here came from Richard Gillis. He wrote all the music for The Ballad of Cable Hogue, which we covered in a Patreon episode last year. He also has a soundtrack credit on A Boy and His Dog, and he composed The Bees for director Zacharias. Cinematographer Alex Phillips Jr., we've seen his work on Cabo Blanco, Fade to Black, and High Risk so far. He later lights Surf 2 and King Solomon's Mines. Editor Sandy Nervig also cut The Bees, and Sandy is credited as an additional director on Ron Howard's Grand Theft Auto, Troll, and Disney's Pocahontas. Hmm. I don't know what an additional director is. It's different than an AD. Samantha Egger played Jennifer Baines. Speaking of Disney, Egger provides the voice of Hera in Disney's Hercules. She also provides the voice of a whale in multiple episodes of Metalocalypse, her most recent credits. Just prior to this, she had appeared as the doctor slash love interest character in The Exterminator, and before that she was Nola Carveth in Cronenberg's The Brood. Stuart Whitman played Father Cunningham. As soon as he showed up in the movie, I felt like I'd seen him play a reverend before, and then I realized that he played the Jim Jones part in Guiana Cult of the Damned for a Patreon review this year. Uh, we also just had him as director Sam in the Humgu story from the Monster Club. He was the guy scouting locations for his Hume vampire goo. movie. Humgu? Humgu. Mm -hmm. That makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Roy Jensen played Mark Baines. He was Mulva Hill in Chinatown. We've seen him so far in Tom Horn, fooling around any which way you can. And he was just the clan leader in Bustin' Loose that was convinced that all the children were blind on the bus. Erica Carlson played Nurse Morgan. Depending on which version of the film you're watching, she might play two characters because she also plays the woman whose boobs pop out for the alternate intro before her hand is chopped off. So she technically dies twice in this film. We saw her earlier as Folg's mate in Caveman. Jose Chavez played Pepe. He's Juan Jose in The Wild Bunch. He's Santos in Romancing the Stone and Bustamante in Cabo Blanco, all of which shot in Mexico, as did this film. Ted White played Frankie. We've seen him before in small roles for Oh God Book 2, Cutter's Way, Going Ape, and The Lone Ranger, where he played the ranger's father. His IMDb photo is of Jason Voorhees, apparently from playing the character uncredited in the fourth installment. He also has a lot of stunt credits, so I believe it. Haji played Angela. She's Rosie in Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Do you recall the last time that that film came up on the show? It was a poster in Polyester? That's right. It was in Elmer's office. She also played Haji, which is the name that she goes by on IMDb, in Bigfoot, and she played Catwoman in Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Whitey Hughes played the Shady Gambler. This was his second to last credit, and we've seen him before as the assistant director of the movie within the movie The Stuntman which I think the only time that he actually gets to say anything is that moment where the director asks him a question and he just repeats whatever the director says. Mm -hmm. But he is a stuntman by trade. Right. Those are all the credits I had for this one. I have to say, after hearing the music for this film, uh, I really want to see the bees. Yeah. Just to see just to see if like the music is just as good. Cause the well, guy didn't I love the music in Cable Hogue, too. Yeah. And he didn't compose a lot. Yeah. Um, and this score is so over the top, but so great. It it reminded me a lot of the Candyman score. Yeah. I think that's everything for Demonoid, a.k.a. Macabre. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord. You can join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at VintageVideoPodcast.com slash Discord. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Nice Dreams, which IMDb describes like so. Disguised as ice cream vendors, Cheech and Chong make, and subsequently lose, millions of dollars selling a batch of marijuana with an unusual side effect. We leave you now with the trailer for Nice Dreams. Columbia Pictures presents Cheech and Chong together again in Nice Dreams, the story of two enterprising young men who make an amazing amount of money selling ice cream. We got seventeen million dollars, man. No. And who are into neighborly visits? Oh, animal. Oh, when did you get out? Come on, open up, bro. Break the door down. 
fine dining. Oh, Rasta. How about sweet? And anything else they can get their hands on. Doctor. Yeah. I have this terrible problem. Oh, you're probably much too busy, Amanda, listen to my problem. Oh, no, no, I'd love to look at your problem. Cheech and Chong's Nice Dreams. Rated R. Don't miss this special movie preview next Saturday, May 30th.